We hear a lot of perspectives on the Mankind Podcast. Inclusion of a guest is not an endorsement of their views, and the opinions expressed here do not always represent the mission or values of the Mankind Project USA. Looks like the rain has gone. Today and welcome to another episode of the Mankind Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Clift, and today we're talking about emotional intelligence. More specifically, how the men and women who serve us in our communities, in our country, those who are on the front lines that are constantly dealing with incredibly challenging, intense, and oftentimes traumatizing experiences, how they can get the tools that they require to still be able to turn up their best and be able to go home to their families and be present as well. So to do that, we have brought in Dr. Gregory Campbell uh, from Talent Smart EQ. I'll, I'll go into his bio when we start the, the interview, but namely what you're going to get out of this conversation is plain and simple inspiration. My goodness, I haven't had an ounce of caffeine today and I feel like I've just had 10 cups having spent an hour with Greg Whoa, amazing man, amazing man. Let's just give you kind of the, the cliff notes. Uh, we talk about really diving into the, the importance of beginning the conversation uh, with our servicemen and women and those in the force, those in the military. How can we start the conversation with them to help them perhaps open their hearts a bit more? Uh, we, we go into what it means to start with the heart as opposed to the head in having these conversations. How do we help, uh, how do we help our police um, deal and manage with their stress and their challenges that they're facing on a daily? How do we help them deal with that uh, and still be able to compartmentalize, but take the lid off and health in a healthy way process those experiences, whether it's through mentorship, whether it's through a, a department kind of uh, implemented program, encouraging them to use those services. What you're going to find from this time with Greg is that his experience, you know, I believe the greatest leaders can turn up with two things, authority and empathy. Authority is I've been in the trenches. I've done the time. I've got the t-shirt and the accolades and the awards. I've done the time. Empathy is, and I get it for that exact reason. I get you. I get it. And I understand. This man has walked the walk. But man, can he talk? Oh, he's so good, so good. So enough from me. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna hold you guys back any longer. I want you to jump straight into this interview, my interview with Dr. Gregory Campbell from Talent Smart EQ as we dive into the power of emotional intelligence. Enjoy. Here it is. Good day and welcome to another episode of the Mankind Podcast, the show where we break the molds of modern manhood to prove there is more than one way to be a man. I am your host, Brandon Clift, and today we are joined by Dr. Gregory Campbell, prefers Greg. Uh, mate, you've got 25 plus years, 27 years of diversified law enforcement experience. Uh, as a federal agent, you worked your way up to deputy chief of the, uh, of the Postal Inspector Service. Uh, mate, you've worked on cases around surrounding like the Unabomber. Uh, there was the anthrax chaos that was occurring a couple of years ago. And uh, but mate, above all else, the work you're doing today is about uh, you know bringing emotional intelligence skills and awareness to law enforcement, people working in the government, servicemen and women, uh, which is a huge part of the work we do with the Mankind uh, Project as well. So really eager to have you with us today, and excited to to glean from your experience. Welcome. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, I'm excited to be here. You know, every day's a a blessing to be able to be on this side of the dirt, you know, and, um, you know, to be here. Um, I'm excited. I'm fired up. You know, I, I will say to your listening audience, you know, I come with a warning. I come with a warning label. You know, people say to me often, Brandon, they say, man, is this guy on six cups of coffee this morning? I have to tell y'all out there. I haven't had one cup yet. I'm just a boy from the inner city of Los Angeles who used to go to SeaWorld and thought I was on an amazing vacation. And so what I remember most about those experiences, Brandon, is sitting on the first row. And then when that well comes along and splash all the water on you, I used to love that. So when I speak, I tell people, you better get ready. 
because y'all are in my splash zone. I'm ready to be with Brandon this morning <laughs> and to talk to all the men all over the world. I'm ready to go. Mate, in the splash zone. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> well, oh, this I can tell this is going to be fun. Um, so, mate, you have an extensive history in law enforcement. And so I'd love to kind of get a bit of a snapshot of where you've come from. And, and if you can, you know, maybe... Let's go to the beginning, growing up in the inner city of Los Angeles and, and how that led you into law enforcement and then eventually getting to working with Talent Smart EQ for emotional intelligence. So please, the mic is yours. Take it away. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. And, you know, as I tell my story, you know, um, it's not a story of victimhood. It's a story of, of blessings, miracles, uh, and overcoming and triumph. It's a story of the power of emotional matter of fact, let me rephrase that unleashing the power of emotional intelligence and self-development. I grew up in Compton, California. You know, if any of you've seen the movie straight out of Compton, I grew up in that environment. Uh, Brandon, I grew up where I didn't have one family member that ever graduated from college. Not one, not one uncle Brandon, not one aunt, you know, Susie or Mary, not one that had graduated from college. At the same time, Brandon, I had about six family members serving 25 years to life in California prisons for different types of crimes. So I had to make a decision. Do I go down that road that leads me to incarceration or do I choose another road? And uh, I chose a different road. I said I wanted to be the first in my family to graduate from college, and I was. I said that I wasn't gonna be incarcerated, that I wanted to work in law enforcement, to bring about change from within. And I don't know, Brandon, I can't tell you even to this day um, how I knew that as a teenager um, that, that I could make a difference from within, but it, I had a passion from a young age to say you could be a victim of the system or you could change the system from within. And that's what drove me towards law enforcement. And after 1991, when the Rodney King incident happened in the Los Angeles area, uh, I joined law enforcement in 1991. That's when I started wow. my federal law enforcement career and moved my way up from a frontline agent all the way up to second in charge of the whole country of the Postal Inspection Service. And if you don't know who the Postal Inspectors are, we're the oldest federal law enforcement agency in the United States. Actually, Benjamin Franklin was the first postal inspector. That's so before right. there was an FBI, before there was a DEA, before there was an, uh, a Secret Service, there were postal inspectors um, that were that were investigating crimes, stagecoach robberies, and bank robberies. And uh, so it was a proud, proud twenty-seven-year uh, career working as a postal inspector, working many types of crimes. And so growing up in the inner city. Um, was not something that was done to me. It was something, all my life story is something that was done for me to create who you see sitting in this in uh, on this podcast today. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be with you all. Fantastic. Well, well that was certainly a 100,000 foot view of, of <laughs> your storied career and, and, and experience. Uh, I, I want to just quickly kind of pull a thread. What do you mean by change from within? And what does that look like in application? Yeah. So literally, I believe that that change begins from the inside out. Ken Blanchard would say it this way, leading with your heart, your head, your hands and your habits. So it starts in the heart, it starts in the heart. One of my favorite books mm -hmm. says it this way, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So a lot of times what comes out of individuals' mouths are coming from their hearts and whether that heart has been hurt, whether that heart has been you know, uh, bruised, uh, you know, in the, in the pre-session, you talked about where, where are we going to go on this call? And so, I, you know, I want to look you right in the eye and say, you know, growing up in Compton wasn't easy. You know, it's where the Crips and the blood gangs actually started in my city. Mm -hmm. And now those gangs are spread out throughout the United States and throughout the world. It started right in Compton, California. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with that. I grew up you know, my, my senior year of high school, I had to heat up water in a microwave bowl because my family didn't have, you know, gas to, 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 to cook on the stove. So we used we used a hot plate and, and I had to take showers at school. You know, um, you know, I grew up watching Venus and Serena 
hitting little green balls on a tennis court, which I believe was the only tennis court in our city. We played basketball, football, baseball, but they didn't let any of what they normally see, saw, the environment, stop them from doing something different. So when I talk about change starting from the inside out, it starts with the heart and then it goes to the head. You know, my favorite book also says that so a man think it, so is he. So if you don't begin to see your change in your mind before you see it with your eyes, you'll never see it. That's why I say if you don't see it before you see it, you'll never see it. So I saw myself making it out of Compton, California, being the first in my family to graduate from college in my mind. I saw myself walking across that stage. I saw myself being handed a diploma before I ever saw it with my eyes. You got to walk it out, man. You got to walk it out. And, and then once you walk it out, it goes to your hands. Your hands are your actions. It's your behaviors. And the more you do things on a daily basis, then they become your habits. And that's what it's all about. How do you start it out from the heart and recognize what's in your heart? Start to see things differently in your mind. Start to live it differently with your hands and your actions. And then create great habits. Leading with your heart, your hands, your hands, and your habits. And that's emotional intelligence. It's the foundation of all of those things. Yeah. I love that, you know, you're talking about starting with the heart, which seems very counterintuitive for a lot of men these days. We're, we're, we're big thinkers, but we're not allowed to feel. Yeah. Whereas women are feelers, but they're not allowed to think, right? Yeah. And so we, we're already destigmatizing feelings and emotions uh, in this conversation. So this is, this is great. This is juicy. I'm excited. How did emotional intelligence end up on your radar? Because I've connected with a lot of uh, law enforcement in my time with the Mankind Project. In fact, one of my neighbors is a major here with the Chattanooga Police Department. And and I'll chat with the fire department guys and gals and just ask their experiences. Like, what are you doing to, you know, to kind of come up for air when you've just experienced something horrible or, or, or quite traumatic? And uh, I know that... Uh, in one person I spoke with, this wasn't in Chattanooga. Um, he, he said that uh, we have a chaplain, but we don't necessarily have other services that we can lean on. And he goes, that's great for me because I'm an atheist. Yeah, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm in great hands here. You wow. know? And, and not to say, I'm sure, not to say that he shouldn't lean on the chaplain and, and, and sure. have someone to talk to and speak to, but that just goes to show how many people are, are facing daily traumatic experiences. Yeah and don't have a healthy outlet to, uh, to kind of take it out of that compartmentalized box. Yeah. So how did this come onto your radar, emotional intelligence? When, when, what was the inciting moment or incident where you went, ooh, I like that? So, so the seed, the seed of emotional intelligence goes back to my upbringing, uh, Brandon. Um, so my dad was one of the, the best athletes in the Los Angeles area. Grew up in Watts, you know, uh, a suburb or a, a, set, a subsection of Los Angeles. At the age of 18, he's drafted to go to Vietnam. My mother's 17 at that time, Brandon, when he's drafted to go to Vietnam. While he's fighting in Vietnam, my mother, 17-year-old young girl who met my father when they were in middle school, she has me while my father's fighting in a foreign country. My father, being one of the top athletes in the Los Angeles area, gets wounded in Vietnam, 100% wounded. He comes back, and what we would now describe today as post-traumatic stress, but for those soldiers who came back from Vietnam, you know the way we treated them, Brandon. We laughed at them. We ridiculed them. They were not seen as our heroes when they came back from Vietnam. Well, that yeah, passed on to killers. yeah that that passed on to my home. Never once did I see my dad cry. Matter of fact, he would say, "Big boys don't cry." Never once. I don't recall. I should say eating dinner with my dad at the dinner table. Not any Thanksgiving, not any Christmas dinner, none of those things. And it wasn't until. And I tell this story every time I speak, Brandon. That's why I told people you're in my splash zone. So if this is triggering you, um, you know, I'll give you some solutions um, as we move forward, some, some tools that you can use. Mm. 
But I tell this story every time I speak about my dad. He showed up to every football game that I had, every sport event, but that, but he wasn't emotional, didn't see his feelings. There was something that was wrong with him when he came back from Vietnam. And my brother, my mother and I, we lived that non-emotional experience or life. It wasn't until about two months ago I was speaking to freshmen at Baylor University and I was telling this story, Brandon, and, and one student raised her hand and she said, well, I, I understand what you just said, but why? Why would your dad not ever eat with you all at the dinner table? And Brandon, sometimes as men, you just talked about it not being a heart a heart issue and not being emotional and not, you know, uh, sort of exploring our feelings. And I think that's one of the myths of emotional intelligence. If it was only just a soft skill, then why isn't everybody doing it? If it's so easy, then why isn't everybody dealing with it? with their emotions or the heart issues. And so, Brandon, when that young lady asked me that question, that young freshman at Baylor University, I paused for a moment, which is an emotional intelligence skill. Just pause. Don't act so quickly. I thought about what she said, and I sort of replayed it in my mind, going back, you know, 50-something years, or 55 years old. And I said, well, why didn't Dad have dinner with us at the dinner table? And I thought about it, Brandon, one of the, the memories that I try to suppress, compartmentalize from a law enforcement turn, wall off, is the memory of my dad being in and out of the hospital. Every other month or so, my dad was in the hospital, in the hospital for injuries that were caused by serving in the United States Marine Corps and an injury he had in Vietnam. And I thought through that process, it's one of the negative experiences of my life. And so I didn't want to think about that. And as that young lady calls me to revisit it, reflect on that memory, I said, uh, my dad had an esophagus issue, a stomach issue from the wound from Vietnam. So anytime he ate, it was extremely painful. So I said, ah, he didn't eat but once a day. And that once a day was a painful experience. And Brandon, I went 50 something years going, my dad didn't eat at the dinner table. And I've tried to express it, talk about it, you know, to others and to tell my story of discovery, healing, and wholeness. But in the, in the, on the inside, in the heart, I was still carrying a little pain, a little sadness. You know, why wouldn't dad eat with us at the dinner table? And it was just a few months ago at Baylor University that I experienced the F word. Now, I know some of what are, some of y'all are thinking and out, out there in the listening audience, the F word. No, 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 not that word. Forgiveness. Hmm. I actually forgave my dad at that moment and said it was the pain he was experiencing. So that brings it forward. So my initial research in emotional intelligence, what took me to emotional intelligence is I wanted to do research on military veterans who were experiencing post-traumatic stress and how emotional intelligence could help them out, oh. could be a tool for them. And I couldn't get the data. The military at that time and even today was experiencing an astronomical number of suicides. The military prepares our soldiers to do war, to do battle. And they prepare them like no other country in the world. What they yeah, don't prepare them to do, what they don't prepare them to do is to deal with their emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's what drew me to emotional intelligence. When I couldn't get the data, you're a college professor. So, you know, in research, data is king. Data is important. I couldn't get the data. So I made a switch. At that time, I was working in law enforcement. I was an executive in law enforcement. So I said, hey, is, there's a similarity between first responders and the, those who serve in our military services around the world. And so I said, ah, I can look at how first responders, military, law enforcement, paramedics, firefighters, nurses, how those individuals process their emotions and how they handle leadership. And that's what drew me to, to the topic of emotional intelligence is because I couldn't get the data and it led me to a wonderful place where I get to get up every day and work with first responders around the world. Mm. Man, that's so powerful. So powerful. 
it, it makes me think about a program I witnessed, I wasn't a part of, but I witnessed called A Journey Home that we mm -hmm. put on through the project. And it was for first responders and servicemen to have a kind of a, a new reintegration, right? They may have been mm -hmm. home for 20 years, right? But a new mm -hmm. reintegration. And mm -hmm. it's so often that that me and, and many people think that the the trauma that servicemen and women experience overseas is the is the root source of of why they're challenging why they're challenged in reintegrating mm -hmm. into society mm -hmm. um but almost unanimously without fail through the work it goes back to that early childhood experience, that adverse yeah. childhood experience of, mm -hmm. and, and the meaning that is made of it. You tell the story about, you know, why didn't dad sit at the dinner table with us? And, and you as a, as a child who we as children are survival experts, survival experts. And we do that by placing meaning on the stories and the experiences that we have and belief systems that help create a bit of black and white. So we know how to zig and zag and duck and jive. And that meaning and belief that you adopted at a young age had been piggybacking you and influencing your experience and your when you you know in relationship with your father yeah. for how many decades? Yeah. And through emotional intelligence, you're able to identify, whoa, that's a story I can change. Yes. I have the data. <laughs> yes. That's a story I can change. And that freshman young woman helped facilitate that. I mean, this is Oh, you know, the, uh, so quick correction, not a professor, um, as much as like, I would love, wouldn't that be cool? Ooh my head would be. Maybe I'm speaking um, it into existence. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the greatest academics I know, um, yeah, they, they never lead with, hi, Dr. Brandon Clift, how yeah. are you? And, and I feel like if I was in that position, I would only lead with Dr. Brandon Clift, how are you? <laughs> Um, but so the, uh, I teach this kind of three week emotional intelligence, uh, kind of, it's like an intro to emotional intelligence, uh -huh. um, through the center for professional education. It's a okay. professional non-accredited and we okay. work with local companies and organizations and man, it, it is really, it's, it's a 30,000 foot view. It's yeah. self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy, yes. Yes. Uh, self-management, relationship management, but it is so hard not to get one of the threads that reveals itself in a class and yeah. very tactfully and respectfully pull it mm -hmm. without fail. Every time this class is taught, tears fall, oh. laughter erupts, anger arises. And these people that were, I mean, the first time I taught this was a room full of tradesmen <laughs> mm. <laughs> who's, who, you know, mud on their work boots, arms crossed, whose boss made them go to this training and, that first session, arms were locked tight. And at the end of those three weeks, man, hearts were open. Yeah. And and they were able to empathize with not only one another, but the the people that have been causing them problems and challenges on the work on the work site. And this is just an introductory class. Yeah. It, it, it's just white belt level. Yeah. yeah. Yet it's so powerful. Yeah. It's so powerful. Brandon, I, you, mind uh, if I, you mind, I thank you for sharing that. You mind if I just share a quick picture sort of to, to give the listeners a, 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 a just a blank canvas to kind of see what you're you're talking about? Please do. Yes, yes. And sort of unleashing, I'm going to call it unleashing the power of emotional intelligence. As you just described that class and you said, there's not a class. It's a three-week class and there's not a class that goes by that you don't sort of pull the string and someone's crying and emotions are going. Every human being goes through about 200 emotion events or triggers in a day. Mm -hmm. So people often ask me, Brandon, well, who's your audience when it comes to emotional intelligence? And one of my colleagues, Demias Perdue, who served 22 years as a, as a United States Marine, he says, anybody with a heartbeat and he hits his chest. So that's for all the men out there in the listening audience. You know, this this emotional intelligence is a man thing. So I'm going to I'm going to hit our chest. So any anybody with a heartbeat, emotional intelligence is for you. And then I come alongside Demias and I say, who's my audience? Anybody with a brain. So I don't 
care if you're talking to firefighters, police officers, you know, uh, auto workers. It doesn't matter if you have a heartbeat and you have a brain. Emotional intelligence is for you. One of my mentors was speaking this weekend, Brandon, and he was speaking to a large audience. And on his suit, he had a piece of string hanging from his suit. And the audio visual team, some of his staff, his team that were filming uh, the session on the break went up to him and they said, you have a string hanging from your suit coat, which he, he did not recognize. It was not bothering him. It was, it was not revealed to him, but his team saw it and they came up with scissors and they cut the string off. Let me paint a picture for y'all with emotional intelligence. When you start to dig into self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management, it's like having a string hanging off your shirt or your jacket or your dress, and you don't see it. You don't even recognize it. But when you start to dig into those emotional intelligence skills, the person on the outside, people that you're accountable to, Maybe it's your wife, maybe it's your children, maybe it's your son, maybe it's your mother, your father, your friend. They see the string hand hanging and they come up and they can cut the string. The question is, are you going to allow them to cut the string? And emotional intelligence gives you the tools to not only cut the string, but to be able to move forward. And that's what this is all about. How do we grow? How do we develop ourselves? How do we become healthy and whole and have a sense of wellness? So you you opened this can. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is a great point to kind of spotlight, uh, you know, your work with Talent Smart. Yeah. And, and I really want to dive deep, like specifically, because yeah. we have so many men in yeah. you know, the armed forces, in the, yeah. the servicemen as well, that we want to um, get into the meat and potatoes. Yeah. Um, but your work with Talent Smart EQ with Dr. Travis um, Bradbury, uh, his book, Emotion, Emotional Intelligence 2.0, is is my kind of Rosetta Stone, yeah. in a sense, around emotional intelligence. It mm -hmm. was my first introduction uh, once I'd gotten involved in men's groups. Yeah. Uh, it's the book that I give and share and hand out. Uh, Talent Smart EQ's uh, Emotional Intelligence Assessment is the is the gold standard assessment. I agree. Mm -hmm. So the resources are there. You've had 300, <clears throat> 3 million people do the assessment. So the data is really powerful. Uh, and... Yeah, I was just this morning in my workout, just listening to uh, Emotional Intelligence Habits, oh, which yeah, just got released. One. It's oh, a good man. one. It's good. It's so juicy and pragmatic yeah. and practical. And what I'm loving about this conversation, and, and you know, I think it's really important. As men in this work uh, that are aware of the benefits, like the water's fine, come jump in, of emotions and feelings and and tapping into that source, it's it's very important to, I think, for us to be bridges for the person that has their arms closed. Yeah. And goes, mm -mm. you know what happened when I showed emotion when I was five? My dad beat me. That's right. You know what happened when I showed emotion on the playground when I was seven? I got ganged up on. And a nickname stuck with me for the rest of my life. You know yeah. what happened when I showed emotion during my divorce? She took everything. Yeah. So there are these experiences, and, and I believe that, you know, uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Paul Kibble or uh, um, his work around defining the act like a man box mm -mm, I have not. at all. Okay. There are, he, so he uh, researched a bunch of kids in Oakland mm -hmm. um, to identify like how early on do kids adopt their beliefs around manhood and masculinity. Mm -hmm. And he found that from like the earliest moments in kindergarten, it's already happening. He would ask his kids, what's the worst thing you could ever be called? Number one above all else was a girl. Mm. What are we teaching boys about women if the worst thing they can be is a girl? Mm -hmm. And what do we assign feelings and emotions to and expression of emotions? Women. So there's this psychology that's already established, whether through nature, nurture, or both in young boys that doesn't get addressed. It just evolves into teen behavior, young adult behavior, fully fledged adult behavior that is the kind of, it's the lens in which a lot of men see the world. Yeah. 
now we have yeah phrases like toxic mas masculinity which i believe in itself is a toxic phrase it's yes, not helpful i agree but, but now it's getting thrown willy-nilly at any male who behaves in a way that is deemed unhealthy regardless of if the behavior is agnostic to any per any gender identity can mm -hmm. behave in said way yet masculinity is is the target in yeah. which means men all that to say we have a responsibility with access to this information to bridge the gap to show these men who have had their arms folded shielding their hearts for 10 20 30 40 50 70 80 years that the water's fine yeah. that they can release their hands that, that there is this untapped uh power this power that can be uh, unleashed within them around emotional intelligence that I just want to scream this from the rooftops. I wish more people were open to this, which leads to my question, Greg, how are you bridging the gap to servicemen and women that have had to wall off these things to survive, just to be able to turn up and do their job and then go home to their families and try and exist as mom or dad or, husband, wife, how, how do you begin that process to just, just crack the door open? Yeah. So let me start with the end in mind. The answer is emotional intelligence. And the answer is creating good habits. Now, let me go back to the beginning. Here's what I start off saying to anyone, especially those who are in law enforcement, who are first responders, hurt people, hurt people. Mm -hmm. So all of those stories you described, Brandon, are stories of pain, of hurt, of guilt, of shame. So you said we were going to get real today. So let's get real. You mentioned the word a minute ago, ACEs. Mm -hmm. Those situations in your childhood, those acute or uh, uh, childhood experiences let me give you one of mine. And um, I didn't plan to do this, Brandon, on this show this morning. Matter of fact, I can count on I can count on one hand. Matter of fact, I can hold up maybe three fingers how many times I've done what I'm about to do. So my childhood ace, my childhood ace experience was being brutally molested by a family member as a child brutally molested to the point where it became my nightmare over and over again being replayed in my mind where I walled it off, I buried it, I became great at compartmentalization. In my nightmare, I would always see my brother in that nightmare and an uncle who was only two years older than me in that nightmare. There was always three of us in that nightmare with my family member. I have not, I've only told this story. This is the fourth time in public I've shared this story. And I share it to your audience because it's a group of men and secrets destroy. Hurt people hurt people. And I was hurting and I buried that hurt to the point where I didn't even know that it was real. Didn't even, is this real? And it wasn't until I took a psychology class in college, I think I was 19 or 20 years old, the abuse, the molestation took place probably, I'm guessing five or six years old. The realization that this was real in my life came about 1920 in a psychology class. The teacher says, I'm going to hypnotize the class. I'm like, uh-uh, no way. I don't even believe in hypnotism. This stuff ain't going to work. Whatever he did, he did it. And in that moment of hypnotism in a psychology class, the nightmare appears. I leave that class triggered, but I make a choice that day, Brandon. I said, I'm going to go and ask my brother and my uncle if they have nightmares too. Mm -hmm. If they're fighting monsters like me. I'm going to call it fighting monsters. 
And my brother said, yes, I have them. My uncle said, yes, I have them. And that was our moment of reality as a 20 year old young guy who thought that something was wrong with me. That am I gay? Uh, you know, I, I didn't know what to experience. I didn't know what my body, I was just fighting monsters, having nightmares, tried to sleep with as many girls as I could growing up as a kid because something was wrong with me. So it starts young. And then a part of me, I go into a profession of protecting and serving others because I didn't want to deal with my own pain and hurt. And I know that for a fact. From, from speaking to law enforcement officers in my current job at Talent Smart and from going to conferences and training police departments and first responders, many of them were hurt in their past. So they go into a profession that helps others, but it keeps them, it helps them wall off, compartmentalize, bury their own pain. Thank you. It's the drama triangle. Mm hmm victim perpetrator mm -hmm. savior hero mm -hmm. rescuer mm -hmm. and i heard this said before from a friend of mine who's in the force and, and involved in the mankind project and he always asks his new recruits you trying to why are you trying to put a cape on why are you trying to put who are you trying to save right and, and it just plants a seed in them to go this this is not a place where people put on a cape and try and save the day because mm -hmm. you're not doing it for them you're doing it for you mm -hmm. and really kind of calls them into that that inquiry of like why am i doing this yeah why did people jump at the opportunity to volunteer to go to vietnam yeah right yeah that's yeah I i'm curious well, let me ask you you probably, you may not have the data of this, but just from your experience, what percentage would you roughly say um, people get into the armed forces or into the police force because of ACEs or because of something that they're perhaps trying to counteract or counterbalance? From I don't, life? I don't have statistics. Yeah. I have yeah. anecdotal uh, mm -hmm. experiences. And I can tell you conference after conference that I go to police department after police department, whether it's here in the U S the UK mm -hmm. or Canada in which our programs are being, being mm -hmm. delivered. There's a commonality hurt people, hurt people, hurt people. and the compartmentalizing the, mm -hmm. the burying, the walling off is common in this profession. Let me share it with you this way. I want to just give you two quick examples. In policing, you know, one of the ways growing up as a kid in the United States, they teach us how to remember things, how to learn things. When you were learning spelling words in the first grade or kindergarten, they say, write them down five times. And if you lived in my house, write them down 10 times, you know, because we're going to do a little extra so you can remember it. So imagine you learn how to remember things from writing it multiple times. Every police department, when you go out on the scene, first responders, you have to do detailed reports and you have to write it down. The next step in life, they tell you, if you want to remember something, a picture is worth a thousand words. Photograph it. Keep it. Remember it. Remember it. The next step in policing is that on the crime scene, on a scene, you photograph the evidence. You take the copious notes, you write it multiple times, you take pictures so you can then testify to it again. Sometimes you have to testify to it multiple times in a trial. Imagine this, imagine responding to a homicide and you're a 19, 20 or 21 year old kid or 23 year old when I started in law enforcement, 23 years old and seeing a homicide or a suicide or or if you're a state trooper and you're you're young in your 20s and you see a car accident of three kids going to their prom and and you smell the burning body as you write it down as you photograph it as you testify to it then your organization expects you to be able to hit delete the delete button 
there is no delete button, men. No. So when you're working as a military veteran, my dad, what he saw in Vietnam, Brandon, he never could delete it. There is no delete button. Mm -hmm. So all the homicides, the, I went 27 years in law enforcement, Brandon, and never once did I seek counseling. Never once. I loved the adrenaline. I would be back at work the next day. Give me a homicide. I'm raising my hand to go out there on it. So that I, that's the adrenaline rush. And we go year after year after year. And many of us, men and women alike, do not raise our hand and say we need help. We don't even stop to debrief it. Now, in today's times, police departments are starting to understand it's important to debrief. It's, in, it's important for wellness, officer wellness. And again, I'll go back and I'll say hurt people hurt people. Let me sum it up another way. Before I stop a car as a police officer, I'm going to get intelligence on that car. I'm going to run the license plate. I'm going to want to know how many people are in that car. I'm going to want to know, is the car stolen? You know, or, you know what's happened with this car? I'm going to get intelligence on that car. Before I go into a house to execute a search warrant, I'm going to say, who lives in that house? Are there guns registered to that house? I'm going to learn some everything I can about that house before I stop a person walking down the street. Oh, are they wearing clothes, you know, big coats and it's 100 degree weather? Is something bulging on the side of them? Are they six foot six and I'm five foot eight? You know, I'm going to get intelligence before I approach that person. So if we can get an intelligence on a car, a house, and a person, why wouldn't we get emotional intelligence on ourselves? And that's the way I present it to first responders. That's why I present it to anybody with a heartbeat and anybody with a brain. It's, it's about the heart and the mind, and we have the ability to, to recognize, understand, and manage those emotions. Hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a great way. Uh, you know, what you've done is you've, you've put it into a frame of reference that, that police can understand, yeah. right? They can, they can a assign meaning yeah. to that. Yeah. Logically, got it, works. I, I, I get this is important, but me and the boys just the other day were giving each other, giving the new guy crap because he was, you know, needed to take a mental health day after a, a homicide or whatever. So how do you, how do you approach interdepartmental? Um, well, or maybe, yeah. How do you, how do you approach that kind of department that is not necessarily open culturally to something like this? I mean, you wouldn't be going in unless someone contacted you to come in and yeah. diagnose that there was an issue here, but what do you do when many influential members of a department, aren't for it. That's weak stuff. That's sissy stuff. Yeah. So first of all, cops can talk to cops. So the way I get in is I tell them I've spent 27 years doing law enforcement. Yeah. I've worked everything from undercover. And empathy. Yeah. You've got Absolutely. the authority and the empathy. Yeah. I call myself a pracademic. I got the academics behind it. I don't go around saying I'm Dr. Greg Campbell. Matter of fact, I say, call me Greg or call me Dr. C. It's just a title. I did it so that I could, when I speak, I could validate what I'm talking about. So yes, I have the academics behind it, the PhD behind it. It's what my research was in. But I also look them in the eye and say, I've lived it 27 years. I've lived this life. And so what I do for those departments, I go in and I call BS. I call BS. And immediately your brains go to what we know BS stands for, what society has told us BS stands for. And I know you listeners out there, you already, you can write it down. If a matter of fact, let's pause for a minute. Write down what BS stands for and just write it down. Now, let me tell you what I say BS stands for. I talk about brain systems, belief systems, and blind spots. Brain systems, belief systems, and blind spots. And that's how I helped police departments see. I was working undercover narcotics and I was good at it, Brandon. Matter of fact, I wasn't good. I was great at working undercover narcotics in the Oakland, California area, working biker gangs, working prison gangs, working street gangs, undercover narcotics. 
it was natural to me because I had family members serving life in prison who were some of the biggest drug dealers in Los Angeles. So it was like I was play acting. I was reliving my childhood. I could make a buy so easy and I was having adrenaline rushes. I was having adrenaline. I loved it that much. It was producing adrenaline in my body. And I would come home. Me and my wife met in high school. We get married in our 20s. And I would come home. We had our first baby. And she would say, how was your day, honey? And I would say, it was good. Where's the remote? A month goes by. She said, how was your day, honey? It was good. Where's the remote? Three months goes by. How was your day, honey? It was good. Where's the remote? Finally, she says, we can't do this. We need to go get counseling. I said, sure, let's go get counseling. I've done this before. I had planned. I'm going to use my interview and interrogation techniques on the counselor. <laughs> I'm good at it. Matter of fact, I will flip them. I'm, I got this. And the counselor said to me, he said, call me ahead of time. And he says, come see me 30 minutes before your wife gets here. Yeah. I went, wait a minute. Who does that? What guy's going to call me 30, tell me to come in early? So I'm thinking, he thinks I got a chick on the side. You know, he wants to talk about that before my wife gets there, but he didn't. He just wanted to meet with me first. And here's what he said to me, Brandon. He said, tell me what you do. And I began to tell him about working in law enforcement, working undercover narcotics. And what people don't recognize about emotions, you feel them before you see them. And yeah. so- so what he helped me understand after listening to me talk about working undercover narcotics, he said, oh, you and your wife won't have to meet with me long. He says, you are hormonal. I said, wait a minute, time out. I'm a real man. I'm a real man. I got a badge and a gun. And I showed him my badge and gun. I said, no, I ain't hormonal. And I'm, and I'm going to just be real. I said, only women are hormonal. I said, no, I ain't hormonal. He said, yes, you are. You're hormonal. You're having adrenaline rushes. I said, mm hmm what, you got to explain that. And he began to explain how adrenaline works. And he said, you're just coming off an adrenaline high when you come home. I said, wow. My wife shows up to the counseling. She has her long list of items when she walks through the door. He puts the toilet paper on. It comes off on top. I told him to come off on the bottom. He keeps leaving the toilet seat up. I'm tired of falling in. She has a long list. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't. She said, this won't take long to her. He says, your husband's hormonal. My wife says, time out. Wait a minute, hormonal. <laughs> and then he explained to her how my brain operated. The BS, the brain system. I was having adrenaline rushes. Here's what he, he didn't stop there, Brandon. So all of you who are having adrenaline rushes out there, who are working in law enforcement, he said, okay, you got a government vehicle. When you drive that vehicle home, he says, play some music, play something you like, listen to sports radio, try to bring yourself down on your drive home. He said, if that, yep, yeah. If that doesn't work, he said, open your door when you drive into the driveway. And he says, just look out, pick up a stick, a rock or any object. He said, put that object on the floorboard of your car. Close the door and leave work in the car. And now you go into the, into the house. That changed my life. We're not talking about rocket science here. We're talking about little simple principles. So I'm going to ask your listeners to do something for me. All of us tough men out there, especially those carrying badge and guns. Have you ever just, just took a deep breath and let it out? Take another deep breath one. Breathe in that Parmiana breath. Just breathe in. And then let it out. Have you ever just took a deep breath and it just it just brings you down a little bit? So sometimes, rather than saying what comes out of your mouth, what you want that's in your head that you want to say that comes out of your mouth, just close your mouth and breathe, or go for a walk. Or as Brandon said, I worked out this morning. Go for a workout. Sleep on it. And then, rather than react, you'll learn to respond. When you do that multiple times. They become what Travis Bradbury says is habits. And that's what this is all about. That's why emotional intelligence is not just a soft skill. It's a power skill. Mm. <laughs> so, well, that answers the question perfectly because you balance the authority. Yeah. You've got the T-shirt. You've mm -hmm. been in the trenches, right? Yeah. 
you've got the empathy and I get it. Mm -hmm. And I get it. Let me show you a new way. Let me show you a new way to de-roll at the end of the day, to take off the uniform and be dad mm -hmm. and be mom when you come home. It sounds like when you were coming home, hey, honey, where's the remote? It was just a numbing mechanism yeah. just to turn it off. Yeah, turning it off. I'm yeah. coming down off a high that I didn't even know I had. Wow. wow. I'm selling I'm selling drugs. I'm buying drugs to, from, from drug dealers to, to arrest them. Yeah. Yet I'm on a drug myself and didn't even know it. Don't miss that. Mm. No, not a jump straight anymore. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. So I, I want to get your kind of snapshot. How have you seen policing change over the years yeah. as it pertains to these skills, awareness around emotions and emotional intelligence practices? Yeah, it's just starting to change. I call it at Talent Smart the next generation of policing, emotional mm -hmm. intelligence training. I call it targeted EQ, Brandon. The reason why I say that, I believe that emotional intelligence is the answer. Whether it's leadership in your department, research says that emotional intelligence has a direct correlation to your leadership style and the way you lead others. People Understood. don't leave organizations, they leave leaders. So if you, I don't care whether your style is servant leadership, charismatic leadership, transformational leadership, situational leadership, it doesn't matter what the style is. If it's not rooted or have a basement foundational floor, in self-awareness, self-management, social awareness and relationship management, you're missing the foundation of the house. And like the three little pig story, when we were kids growing up, when turbulence comes, when trials come, when the storms come, your house is going to be blown down. Another way that EQ is targeted in law enforcement is for mentoring. Many police departments are making a transition now. They're creating peer mentoring programs. Uh, buddy programs for officers and trying to break down the stereotype of raising my hand saying that, hey, I just had a homicide event. I need to debrief. I need a day off. I need a mental health day. And that's become, we're trying to bring down that stigma. We're not replacing counseling and, and, and uh, uh, counseling with emotional intelligence. They are tools that go hand in hand. Yes. They go hand in hand. Yeah. Also, you can have emotional intelligence in your training. That's targeted. Whether you're doing de-escalation, firearms. Rather than your firearm being your first weapon of choice, why couldn't your brain be your most your weapon of choice? That's You can de-escalate a situation if you learn to respond to it and not react to it. So defensive driving. Let me give you a good example of how emotional intelligence is tied to training. If an officer is responding to two kids at a high school having an altercation, emotions aren't very high. You take your time, you finish your donut and coffee, and you respond to that high school, and you deal with the situation. But say, for instance, you're having that donut and coffee, and all of a sudden it comes across your radio and your computer, shots fired. Officer down, officer down. Now your heart's beat. Now your hands are sweaty. Now you gotta have you gotta drive safely to that scene and understand what to do when you arrive there. Think about the school shootings, Uvalde, the in Tennessee. Think about the church shootings, okay. bank shootings, and all the things that have happened. And those officers having to make split second decisions and not know how to manage their emotions. We've been trained to manage our emotions in law enforcement, but that's at work when you have the hat on. But how do you manage those emotions when you're not at work? And that's what we're teaching officers to do. Yeah. Imagine community policing. Now I do have the data here. I have three doctoral students that have done recent research on the perceptions of law enforcement officers as it relates to use of force and the community as it relates to use of force. What we've seen from the community is that most citizens' perceptions of law enforcement do not come from direct interaction with police. They come from media, television, and mm -hmm. you know social media, not direct contact with police. So I put the onus on police departments, and I tell them that data. And I say, you as a police department has an, have an obligation to educate your community. 
Community policing shouldn't be interaction only when there's a crime. It should be interaction proactively. What better way to interact with your community in rather other than teaching them what you're doing at Chattanooga, Tennessee, Chattanooga, is say, let's teach the community about self-awareness social awareness, self-management, and relationship management. And now we can help them understand how police officers police and they just want to go home at night. It's a different different way to see it. You talked about a different lens. Think about it, Brandon. Think about it, listeners. If you wear glasses like me or you wear contacts, when you go to the eye doctor, the optometrist, they tell you to look at the big sign. And they say, tell me the biggest letter you see. And you say, oh, I see the E. And then they put you up against the machine and they say they're going to change the lenses. And as they change the lenses, they want to know which one is clear, one or two. Clear, clear. And they begin to change the lenses on the device and you say one is clear, two, one, two, clear, clear. That's emotional intelligence. All we're trying to do is say, hey, Brandon, let's change the lenses. One, two, clear, clear and help you see things from your perspective. And social awareness helps you see things from my perspective, not right or wrong. Emotions aren't right or wrong, they're just data. Yeah, you're getting past the power dynamic. Yeah, That comes from oppressor and oppressed, right? That's right. Many of these communities have established the police and then the community, Yeah, especially in Compton, I mean. yeah. Come on, that was the hotbed of yep. some of the worst of this, right? Yep. Um, especially the time you were growing up, man. So yeah, th- these these officers, let's just say, you're coming in, arms are crossed, their arms are crossed, and they're probably thinking, oh, well, this is going to help us do our job better. And in essence, it's like, sure, but we're going to be talking about how you're going to do life better. That's you're right. Go home and turn That's up right. in the other roles that you play. That's right. Outside of an officer of the law. That's right. Mm. Mm. Mate, Matter of fact, I, Brandon, I, can, I, ahead, can I, so, so I was, you know, I talk about how do you change the hats? You know, how do you wear the right hat in the right situation, Brandon? I got to tell this story. So two, uh, two weeks ago, I was at a women leaders in law enforcement conference, a conference of all women and, and women leaders and chiefs and sheriffs. Oh, it was amazing. One of the best conferences I've ever been to. And I'm talking about wearing the right hat. And one of the ladies, the, she was a lieutenant for San Diego Police Department. And her name was Christina. And I said, Christina, how do you change the hats? And she says, I don't change my hats. She says, I have a big sombrero. And, it, and I went, wow. So women in law enforcement experience things entirely different like they don't even have the ability to change hats. They have to wear a sombrero and everything's done. How do you be a police officer, deal with all the emotions of work and then go home, have to be a wife, a mother of your children. And she says, I don't even change hats. I just have one big sombrero. And I said, Ooh, I'm using that. Gotti, Matt, pause and think about that for a moment. If you don't have tools to deal with those emotions, then Christina's taking that home and it impacts her marriage, it impacts her children, it impacts her relationships with her friends. Yeah. This is why emotional intelligence yeah. is important. That's very much akin to the the padded shoulder mm-hmm. kind of experience mm-hmm. for women in, in the professional space, right? Mm-hmm. In the business mm-hmm. world is those that power stance with the pantsuit and the padded shoulders. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's all good being the badass in the boardroom. But what happens when there's no D roll when it, and you end up in the bedroom, mm-hmm. right? There it is. Got to be able to identify those roles and that's right. You know, masks in ways. So this show is actually an evolution of a previous show we had called Masks Off Monday. Ooh, and we I would like have these, that. Yeah, we'd have these people come in and and various experts, and we'd ask them like like behind the mask. We all have them, but behind the mask, let's get to that. And these masks, in essence, it's easy to villainize them and demonize them as inauthentic and not real, but they're personas. Yes. Personas that we develop and they're extensions of us, whether that's coming from a good source or whether that's coming from a shadow, something that's been hidden, repressed and denied. Mm -hmm. 
And these personas are important, man. I, mean, I need to put on that padded shoulder, badass like mask to do my mm -hmm. duty and do my job. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, when it comes to the ones that matter, the ones that depend on you, the ones that married you for your heart and your soul and not your role and your title and your description and yeah. your, your LinkedIn bio, how are you allowing them access to see that? That's right. And many of us have never done that since the age we were four and that thing happened to us. That's right. Right. And so there emotional intelligence, man, it's just, oh. okay. <laughs> well, final question for you yes. before we wrap up. So this is the magic one question. And this is Greg, if your mission in life or in this work is enacted, is achieved, what does the world look like? Or what does law enforcement look like when you achieve your mission? A healthy organization filled with healthy individuals. Hurt people hurt people, but I don't stop there. Inspired people inspire others. Nipsey Hussle, who was a, a rapper, an entertainer from the inner city of Los Angeles was killed in a, in a, in a shooting in the Los Angeles area. I never listened to any of his movie, uh, his music, but I was intrigued by what he was trying to do to change the perception of, of, of kids growing up in gang areas, the kids growing up with aces. And I love the, 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 how he was trying to revitalize the inner city of Los Angeles. Nipsey said it this way, Brandon. He said, if the people in your circle don't inspire you, then it's not a circle, it's a cage. I'm gonna say that one more time. If the people in your circle don't inspire you, then it's not a circle, it's a cage. So I say that to police departments. Are you working in an inspired environment, a circle, or are you working in a cage? And that's, I think, ideal for this group of listeners as you have circles all over the world. You got thousands of circles out there and you men listening, you're in a circle. You're in a circle. And I want y'all to do a self-check today. Is it a circle or is it a cage? And that's why circles are so important. So as we move forward, if we don't change the way we do policing, the number one issue that police departments are facing right now is recruitment issues. Young people don't want to become a part of policing. And federal agents have mandatory retirement at 57. So there is a continuous pipeline in law enforcement where they have to keep hiring new officers. Well, if our younger generation doesn't see law enforcement as a noble profession, then we won't have police societies. And I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to live in an area where we don't have police. That's called chaos. What I want is a police force that's healthy and whole, that is self-aware, that can manage themselves well, that is socially aware and knows how to have relationship management, not only with themselves, their, their, their inner agency, but with their community. And that's what the ideal police force looks like. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Greg, oh, I'm so inspired. So inspired. I've already got the men and women in my life and, and, and within my network that that are active in the force that I just can't wait to to share this with them and and, and get this message out there. Uh, here's your opportunity now to to really you've given so much to us in this hour that we've spent together. Yeah. Now you get a chance to unabashedly and unashamedly ask, what is your ask for our audience? Uh, those who serve and who don't. What is your ask for them before we wrap up? Yeah, to be open, to be open, one, two, clear, clear. Just to be able to take off the mask, take off the glasses, the contacts, and just try on your prescription and allow emotional intelligence to allow you to see the things you need to see, reveal the things you need to reveal. One of the toughest questions, Brandon, in my life, one of the toughest conversations I've ever had in my life was with myself looking in the mirror. So my ask is that the listening audience would not be afraid of the mirror. You know, when I look in the mirror, sometimes as a man, I do a quick peek. I can get dressed in 15 to 30 minutes and I'm out the door. Hmm. With permission, 
I share this story. My wife, on the other hand, when she gets up in the morning and she goes to look in that mirror in the bathroom, she's looking for something that changed overnight. Is there a bump? Is there a pimple? Is there a hair out of place? Is my eyelash? And, and so she goes to mirror number one and she looks at the big mirror. Then she turns around and she looks at mirror number two, which is the full body mirror in the in the bathroom. And then she goes to mirror number three. And it's this little funny mirror on the on the counter uh, that she, I call it the, the circus mirror that makes everything looks big. And and she does. Yeah, she does her makeup and she pulls her eyelashes and all of that. And then, you know, one of my pet peeves is being on time. And I was like, honey, we got to go. We got to go. She says, I'm getting ready. I'm I'm checking on things. I'm looking in the mirror. And then when we get in the car, the first thing she does when she gets in the car, Brandon, is she pulls the flap down and she's looking at the mirror <laughs> in over in the visor. And then she has another mirror in her purse. Mirror number six is called the compact. She opens it up for just the last look and she's getting some final peeks. And then she has another one these days when she gets out. She turns the camera on her cell phone and reverses it as she gets out the car and takes a final look. So my, my last call to the audience is that you. It starts with developing you, developing you, unleash the power of self-development and emotional intelligence in your lives. And it starts with the toughest look, the toughest conversation you ever have is with yourself in that mirror. But we have some tools for you and their emotional intelligence tools, how to lead with your heart, your head, your hands and your habits. And that leads to, you know, even Travis Bradbury's latest book. I think it's the number two on the New York Times bestseller this week. And it's called EQ Habits. I will have my own book coming out by the end of the year. It's called Developing You, Unleashing the Power of Self-Development and Emotional Intelligence and 11 Practices of How to Have Personal and Professional Success. So I'll leave it at that. Follow me on LinkedIn or Instagram. I will have links to all of the above available in the show notes for those of you that are listening in. And Greg, let's get you back on you better when believe you're releasing it. that book. We'll do another live. We'll uh, we'll get an episode out to dive deeper into it. Man, yes, thank sir. You. Thank you for your gift and what you're bringing to the world. Thank you for the impact that you're having and the mission. The mission is just so incredibly powerful and inspiring. And you know, you're helping you're helping men and women get out of their circle, get out of their cages and find yeah, circles. That's right. Find, find communities circles. that can hold them up. And this is just fantastic. Uh, so thank you. Thank you again for being here. And of course, none of this is possible without you, the listener, and those that have joined us live today on Facebook. Uh, all 1.5 million of you wonderful human beings that follow our work, that support what we do. This has just been a, a wonderful moment to create this alchemy with you, Greg, and to share it with you, the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for turning up each and every week for another episode of the Mankind Podcast, the show where we break the molds of modern manhood to prove there is more than one way to be a man. What do you say, Greg? Have we done that today? Yes, sir. <laughs> Fantastic. Wonderful. <laughs> Lots of love. We will see you next week. Well, there you have it. Another powerful and no doubt inspiring episode of the Mankind Podcast with Dr. Gregory, prefers Greg Campbell. Man, I don't know how you are feeling after that episode, but I am I am so amazed and inspired that there are men like Greg that are going into organizations, going into fields that have historically had such uh, resistance and hesitancy to to look at things like emotions and feelings and, and especially emotional intelligence, which it's not a new concept. Emotional intelligence is not a new thing. It was basically kind of founded or the understanding of it came out in the 60s. And it wasn't till the 90s when Daniel Goleman's book, Emotional Intelligence, came out that it, it hit a broader, it, it kind of hit our awareness. It started to become more common knowledge. But I'm, I'm telling you right now, Dr. Travis Bradbury's work with Emotional Intelligence 2.0 and now Emotional Habits, Emotional Intelligence Habits, which I've been diving into. It is so good. Um, th this stuff is life-changing. I'm telling you right now, I, I get a class of, uh, recently I worked with a class of freight brokers that work in the logistics space and their leadership teams wanted them to learn emotional intelligence. 
Why? Because they're on the phones dialing it a hundred times a day. They're dealing with disgruntled, uh, unhappy truck drivers or wholesalers, and they're having to deal with a lot of high intensity. Well, it's a high intensity work environment. And they're usually dealing with people with very hot emotions and that's all well and good, but there's still a class full of people with their arms crossed going like, what is this even about? So my dream and wish and vision is that the perception of value around emotional intelligence grows the more that we have these conversations, the more that we bring conversations like Greg and I just had to your ears, uh, the more that we can make it clear that emotional intelligence is not a soft skill. It is a power skill. I'm, I'm adopting that. I've called it a soft skill forever. I'm changing that now. It's a power skill. Thank you, Greg. We've got to get these skills in front of people and show them just how amazing things amazing things will change for most of us in our lives once we have them. I, I personally accredit it to why the past four jobs I had required a bachelor's degree and I'm a college dropout. It's my ability to interview, connect, identify problems and resolutions and solutions and me being that solution. It's networking, it's relationship management. And it starts with, you know, our men's circles. What do we do in our men's circles? We build self-awareness. We build awareness of ourselves. We look in that mirror, as Greg says, and we get to know ourselves. We become the CEO, the expert of our own lives. And then there's the self-regulation, which is the self-management of when I have these feelings, when I have these triggers, what do I do? Do I react when someone cuts me off and throw up a middle finger? Or do I take some box, you know, some breaths, do some box breathing, give them a pass and say, "Who, you know what, maybe they were in a rush or an emergency, as opposed to the former reaction of hot emotions. These skills are so amazing and so powerful. And I really hope that you know, you had a lot to sink your teeth into today. What I really want to encourage those of you listening that if you yourselves are not, uh, you know, a uh, serviceman or woman, uh, not someone who's a first responder, uh, but you know someone who is, please share this episode with them. The greatest gift and, and the fee for this episode and the incredible value that Greg has brought to you today, that fee is to share this episode with someone you know who is frontline as a first responder, as a policeman or woman, please get this episode in their queue, text it to them, share it with them. It, for all we know, it could, it could change their lives and the lives of the people that they're hired to protect and serve. So that's the call to action today. I hope you got a lot of value out of this conversation. And as always, we're so grateful for the time that you take to be here, be present and, and learn just like I get to learn from all these incredible human beings that have come to share their wisdom and experience with all of us. Lastly, iTunes. We would really appreciate if you take a moment, go to the link in the show notes, just to jump on iTunes, give us an honest review. I'm not going to give you the arbitrary five-star spiel. What, however much value you believe we are providing, we would love that rating and review. It gets this message and other messages of people that we bring onto the show. It gets it out there. It plays with the algorithm. However, it does. So that's my final call to action. Lots of love. I appreciate the time you spent with us today and we'll see you next week. This has been another episode of the Mankind Podcast produced in association with the Mankind Project USA. We have been your host, Boyson Hodgson and myself, Brandon Clift, and we want to thank our guests for joining us today and imparting their wisdom from their experiences in this amazing journey called life. If you want to find out more about today's guests and support them in their mission, you can find links to them in the show notes. Now, if you have found gold and insights that you believe could benefit your loved ones and those you care about, be sure to share it with them. And of course, we are always grateful for a rating and review of the show on iTunes. Now, above all else, we've got to thank you, the listener, because through your attention and your support, you have made it possible for us to let men all over the world know that they are not alone and that there is more than one way to be a man. And if something in this episode has touched you, then perhaps it is the call to action to get involved in men's work. With live trainings happening constantly and in-person trainings happening all over the world, the Mankind Project definitely has something for you. Now, if you've enjoyed the music in this episode and all of our episodes, be sure to check out Jim Donovan and the Sun King Warriors. I have links to them in the show notes. 
And lastly, just know, what it means to me to be a man is completely different than what it means for you. That is the beauty of this journey. So if you are looking for guidance, support, and community as you begin to unpack and dive deeper into your men's work journey, then you know where to find us. Same place, same time, next week. Lots of love. We'll see you then.